The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. So our first speaker today is Mr. Jay Shillstone. Some of you might know him. He's an ACI fellow. He is the chairperson of ACI 304, and he's on the uh, 303 committee. He also was a fundraising chairperson for this year's convention. So if you have a chance to thank him for all his hard work, uh, he, he's been doing a lot in the last six months to a year. Uh, Jay is a concrete technologist at Command Alcon in Plano, Texas. Uh, Command Alcon is the, the maker of Command Series and Command QC, which are uh, software that's used in concrete quality management and production. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jay Shilstow. Well, howdy. I'd like to welcome you all to Dallas uh, as part of the local chapter committee. We're excited to have everybody here. We think we're going to have a good time for you. I hope you enjoyed the opening reception last night. And we've got even more fun planned for tomorrow night at the Mixer at uh, Gillies. So I hope everybody's going to have a chance to get to that. Now, uh, you may ask those of you that know about Command Alcon, you know we have nothing to do with architectural concrete except help the concrete producers match the concrete. Well, I'm a man of many hats, fundraising chairman, concrete technologist, and I've been working in architectural concrete for all of the 35 years that I've been in the concrete industry. Uh, but it goes on before that. Uh, way back when, uh, my father started working on architectural concrete. I guess I'm going ahead of myself here. But uh, the thing about architectural concrete is it gives you all kinds of options. You can make gently flowing structures, curves. You can do straight lines. You can do beautiful structures in different colors. There are lots of different ways that you can use architectural concrete to enhance the artistic aesthetics of a concrete project. This is the uh, water gardens over in Fort Worth. If uh, any of you have a chance to go over to Fort Worth and see the water gardens, it's a, a very impressive structure. For those of you that have long memories, there was a TV, I mean, a movie called Logan's Run back in the 1970s or 80s that used the water gardens as one of its settings. It was a futuristic movie, and that was part of the um, uh, one of the settings. Oh, this uh, is the great muse uh, the muse art museum of the Southwest in Corpus Christi. Any of you that live on the Texas coast may have seen it before. And then we've got other kinds of structures that can take a beating out in the North Sea that can use concrete and still wind up with an acceptable uh, or a beautiful looking uh, structure. So we can do all kinds of things with concrete it's limited only by the imagination of the people who are designing and building the concrete. And so that's one of the great things that people like about architectural concrete is all the options that are available to us. And I'd like to sort of uh, dedicate this to my father, Jim Shellstone, who passed away about, uh, well, a little over a year ago. My father in 1962 formed a company called Architectural Concrete Consultants. And this was at the time when Architectural concrete was really starting to catch on again. This is when the work of uh, uh, I.M. Pei and Philip Johnson and so forth was starting. And my father started working with architectural concrete, looking at how to make the concrete work right the first time. And as part of that, in 1979, well, in 77, he wrote an article, Concrete Construction, Making the Process Work. Part of the experience that he encountered uh, showed that when you do architectural concrete correctly the first time, that you can have a very cost-effective, very good-looking material 
it's going to last a long time. But if you screw the concrete up initially, it can be very expensive to pull it out, replace it, or try to patch it. And so he developed this approach, this nine-step approach, to uh, managing the concrete construction process. So I wanted to bring that back. It's still as germane today as it was back in 1977 when he presented it. And in 1979, he won the Wasson Medal for Most Meritorious Presentation to the Institute based on this concept. So I'm bringing it back, but I'm also updating it somewhat for some of the newest technologies. Now, the paradigm that makes it easiest for us to understand this is the jigsaw puzzle, where all the parts have to fit. And the problem is that concrete construction is the only manufacturing process that occurs on the construction site. If you look at everything else that's going on on the construction site, you're basically taking a bunch of tinker toys, putting them together, doors, windows, partitions, ceilings, plumbing, electrical. Concrete is the only thing that we're doing on site where we're starting with one set of materials, rock, sand, cement, water, reinforcing steel, forms, and when the time comes for us to take the forms away, we have a totally different material than we started with. We now have concrete. We no longer have rock, sand, cement, and water. And that makes the concrete construction process a little bit different from any other process that we see on the construction site. And so that's why it takes a little bit of extra effort to understand the concrete construction process. Once we understand the process, it makes it easier for us to do concrete right the first time. So we have these different parts to the puzzle. And central to the whole thing is, there we go, there's our mouse cursor. And central to everything is the project drawings and specifications. If the project drawings and specifications aren't right, the rest of the project is not going to be right. And as we change the shape of one of the pieces of the puzzle, we have to change other pieces of the puzzle so that we maintain a complete puzzle. For example, say the reinforcing steel has to go closer together. We're in a seismic zone. That means we're going to have to change the concrete mix. We may have to go to a smaller maximum aggregate size, which means we're dealing with new materials. So we have to reproportion those materials differently. And if we can't get a one-inch stone between the reinforcing steel, how are we going to get an inch and a half vibrator between the reinforcing steel? So we may have to change the shape of the puzzle for the vibrators. And then if we're going to be using form vibrators in the concrete, on the concrete, we may have to change our formwork to beef it up so that it will handle those form vibrators. So all these parts are connected. If we change the shape of one part, we have to change the shape of the other parts. The problem is, many times on the construction site, we have people that are familiar with one part. We have the pumper who knows how to pump the concrete. We have the formwork sub who knows how to assemble the formwork. But does the formwork sub ever talk to the pumper? Not in my experience. Does the guy who's erecting the reinforcing steel ever talk with the testing lab about the concrete mix and what's going to happen to it as it goes over the reinforcing steel? Not in my experience. So there are a lot of different parts to the puzzle that have to come together and different people on the job site have to understand the functions of others so that we can bring this entire construction process together and get a harmonious product. So that's still a little bit off, but that'll do. Central to the uh, system is the project drawings and specifications. Again, if the drawings and specs aren't right, then the project won't be right. The summary I wanted to make about concrete is it's the ultimate in functional artistry. We can make a product that looks good, that follows a function, but we have to understand the concrete, both in its plastic state and its hardened state. We have to understand the concrete process. To properly design a structure, we have to know the materials that are available. Then we have to recognize the limitations of the material and the process, and we have to understand our process of creating the architectural concrete. For example, have you ever heard the story about uh, a sculptor, famous sculptor, a sculptor in stone was asked, how do you sculpt a figure in stone? And he says, if I'm going to make a, picture, uh, make a sculpture of a horse, I take a block of stone, 
and I cut away anything that doesn't look like a horse. A person who does woodworking. Does anybody in here whittle? Do some wood, a couple? Okay. I've heard it said, I'm not a whittler myself, but I've heard it said that many times a whittler will take a piece of wood and he won't know what's in that wood until he starts cutting away the pieces of the wood and then all of a sudden the grain of the wood, the shape of the wood reveals what's contained inside the wood. And concrete is that way. When you know the materials, when you know the process, when you understand the equipment that's available, the types of formwork that are available, then the concrete can reveal to you exactly what the ultimate appearance is going to be. And so concrete is something like, unlike any other material that we are using on the construction site. The designer can use his imagination to create this idea, but then it's up to the contractor to take that idea and turn it into reality using the types of equipment and materials and formwork and consolidation and what have you that is going to help reveal that idea. So architectural concrete is something where we have to have true teamwork so that the constructor can work with the designer to make sure that they can get the design that is desired. Once you understand the process, it makes it a lot easier to do that. And we can do things like this that last 2,000 years, the Parthenon. We can do things like this that are more modern, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We can do things like this, one main place here in Dallas. If you go over, you may have seen the building that has the green vertical lights on it. On the other side of that building, you'll see one main place, which was built I believe in 1965. And yeah, it's a little dirtier today than it was back then, but it still is as effective today as it was back in 1965. And we can also have disasters like this if we don't take things into consideration and understand the process that's involved and the materials that we've, we've been using. Now again, it all starts with the drawings and specs. And the first thing in drawings and specs, prior proper planning prevents poor performance. And uh, the reason I say that is there was a study done by the British Building Re uh, uh, Research Establishment back in 1975 that of 500 buildings surveyed around the world, 60% of the problems in the buildings originated from the design. So you, how many of you are contractors out there? Would you raise your hands? A couple of contractors. How many of you are designers? Would you raise your hands? Materials people? Just a couple of materials people? Okay. Well, so we're about 50-50 split between contractors and designers. Contractors, you complain about the architects and the engineers. Architects and the engineers, you complain about the contractors. Well, 60% of the uh, problems in the field originated from faulty designs, according to this BRE study. 35%, though, originated from the workmanship. So contractors, you're not blameless out there either. You have to be able to have properly trained people to be able to accomplish the designs that are being created. And the materials people, they're happy only 10% are usually uh, or typically uh, related to the materials. So the architect and the engineer need to start off understanding the materials of the process. Then they need to produce a design that's constructible. Back in the late uh, 70s and 80s, I believe, ACI actually had a committee called the Constructability Committee. It was, a, I think, a board task group at the time. Uh, my father was involved in that. But the idea being architects and engineers should design structures that are inherently buildable. If you design a structure that's buildable, then it's a lot less expensive to build it. If you design a structure that's not buildable, then it's very expensive to build it, and you're going to have problems on the job. At the, um, and one of the best ways to help determine if a project is buildable or not is to have a pre-bid conference so that the contractors are fully aware of the intent of the architect and they can express their concerns back to the architect and say, we're going to have problems with this, have you considered this? So you want to have a dialogue going back and forth. With architectural concrete more than with any other type of concrete, you want to have a true partnership. And then, of course, once you've got the bid and you're getting ready to start, you want to have a pre-construction conference so that everybody knows the details 
of how things are going to be built and in what sequence and what's going to be the impact of certain construction uh, requirements on the aesthetics and also what are the important factors of the aesthetics so that the contractor is going to be able to address those points and make sure that they're done properly. And then finally, the best way to assure the contractor can build the project as designed is to do a full-scale mock-up and, um, let's see, there we go, there's the full-scale mock-up. You want it to be full-scale with all the reinforcing steel, the exact formwork, the exact footing uh, layouts that you would have in the normal structure. Because by doing this, you can determine when you're going to have problems out in the field. Do all the components come together? Does the reinforcing steel uh, impact blockouts and so on? And the only way that you can adequately do this is through a full-scale mock-up. A lot of people have been talking about how BIM is going to help us in, uh, avoid all the problems out in the field. Well, not necessarily, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So I spend a lot of time talking about the original contract documents, the design, the, uh, uh, the intent of the architect and engineer. Because they are central to the whole project, we want to make sure that the project is going to be buildable, that we can achieve what the architect and engineer truly want us to achieve. And that's, in today's designs, not always possible. I've seen some of the designs that are coming out of Europe, and you can't always build those designs. Uh, the Europeans, unfortunately, are, in my opinion, way ahead of what we do in the United States, both in terms of design and construction, but there are some things that, e that I've seen that they, even the Europeans aren't able to do. So we have a way to go, but there's a lot of potential out there. Now another thing that architects and engineers should consider is the impact of different parts of the construction process on the finish that they're trying to achieve. The Construction Specifications Institute uh, back in 1974 created the CSI map monograph on cast-in-place architectural concrete. Uh, if you can't get it from CSI, then you can contact me. I'll be happy to, to send you a copy. But one of the things that it has is this grid. And across the top of the grid, it shows the uh, different uh, types of finishes that can be achieved, sandblasted, as cast, and so on. And down the side, it shows the different aspects of the concrete construction process that are going to impact that finish. So for example, uh, oh and then the numbers here in the middle of the grid, they relate how important these different factors are to that finish. And for example here, cement color, which is right over here, is going to have a number one importance when related to a smooth as cast surface color of the cement is going to be one of the primary factors that's going to affect the color of the concrete because we take the forms off and whatever is there is there. And it goes through all these different types of finishes and shows you where the important characteristics are. If we're doing an as-cast finish, the color of the rock is not necessarily going to impact us at all, but the color of cement will certainly impact us. So this is something that you probably want to look at if you're designing an architectural concrete. What are the most important facets that are going to be impacting the quality of your concrete? A word of warning, exposed concrete is the most difficult finish to achieve. A lot of designers think, oh, we're just going to cast the concrete, take the forms off, and whatever is there, that's what we're going to take. And then the first forms come off, they look at the concrete and say, oh my gosh, that's not what I wanted. What do I do now? And the only thing you can do is either paint it or tear it down and start over again. What I find that most designers want, most architects want, when they say exposed concrete, thinking it's, going to, it's not going to be architectural concrete, it's going to be exposed concrete, so it's going to be cheaper. They don't want exposed concrete. They want smooth, as-cast architectural concrete, which is the most, uh, the most difficult finish to achieve. So a word of warning, those of you that either design for exposed concrete or who have to build exposed concrete, it, what you are asking for and what you are going to receive may be two entirely different things. So you have to understand the distinction between the two. 
Whenever somebody tells you that something is almost like something else, you should usually run, don't walk. So if exposed concrete is almost like architectural concrete, that's a problem. Run away from those things, don't walk. If you want architectural concrete, specify architectural concrete. The same thing holds true with super plasticized concrete, I mean uh, self-consolidating concrete. If somebody has a concrete mix that they say is almost like self-consolidating concrete, those are the concrete mixes that I've had the most problems with on jobs. Yeah, they may flow, but they segregate, they're difficult to handle, and so I either design self-consolidating concrete or design fluid concrete, but don't design almost self-consolidating concrete. So exposed concrete is the most difficult finish to achieve. Be aware of that, be on the lookout for it. This is an example of an exposed concrete finish. This is the Pulitzer Art Museum. The picture behind it is also the Pulitzer Art Museum. And it's considered as one of the best exposed, as cast architectural concrete finishes. When you look at the uh, picture in the back, you can see a very good looking concrete structure. But when you start to look at the details, yes, there are variations. Nothing in concrete is going to be uniform. There is always a certain degree of variability. There are going to be imperfections. If you want to design a structure to contain those imperfections and to embrace that variability, then you've got a great medium here. If you want to design a structure that's perfectly smooth and uniformly colored, then you're designing for paint. So be prepared. You want to embrace the characteristics of the concrete, understand those characteristics in order to achieve, uh, in order to understand uh, how that material is going to impact your ultimate design. Now another thing that has recently been happening in uh, concrete specifications is the move toward performance specifications. Architectural concrete specs have traditionally been very prescriptive. We tell you what mix design to use or what materials to use, what types of formwork to use, how to place the concrete, how to consolidate the concrete, what types of finishes are to be applied. And that's a very prescriptive routine which a lot of designers are trying to get away from. Trying to write a true performance concrete specification is very difficult. And one of the things that we're starting to do right now is look at uh, describing the variations that can occur in architectural concrete. In this case, I've got uh, a page here that relates to rock pockets due to segregation. We take a, uh, a condition that we don't want to have necessarily, or a condition that we do want to have. We provide pictorial examples of that, describe it, and then this has been attached as an addendum to a specification, more or less a pictorial dictionary, so that in the specification you can say, uh, rock pockets larger than four inches square will not be acceptable. And then you have a reference back to the document that describes what the rock pocket is and it can, in this particular case, we've also provided some possible solutions, but only from the standpoint not to specify those solutions, but to describe what is causing the problem, what the typical solution is to the problem, so that we can understand what the problem is itself, so that we can define the problem, and then in the specifications we say, you will either not have this type of condition, or you are limited to a certain amount of this condition. So for example, you can say there will be no rock pockets, or you can say rock pockets will be limited to six square inches per 100 square, 100 square feet. And so it gives you a technique for specifying a condition that you want or don't want, and then setting up criteria for meeting that condition. It gives you an opportunity for writing a performance specification based on the physical, the, the surface characteristics of the concrete. This is something that we're just starting with right now, but um, is something that has some promise. This is the type of thing that we can use to describe the physical characteristics, the surface characteristics of the concrete, and then in the specifications we can say, we want this characteristic or we don't want this characteristic. And right now I'm up to about 80 different characteristics uh, in the document that I created. And this is the approach that I take with all these different characteristics. So we're trying to make it more uh, easier for the architect to specify, create a performance specification 
that describes the things he will accept, the things he will not accept. So that's uh, one of the things that uh, is coming up more, uh, more currently. Now after project drawings and specifications, we start looking at the ingredients, the raw materials going into concrete, the color of the cement that we're going to have, the color, the shape, and the size of the aggregate that we're going to have, the gradation, even the water that we're going to have. If you're in an area where they're not able to use potable water, you may actually have uh, water that's going to contain materials that can color your concrete. And so we want to take these mixture ingredients, put them together in a form that's going to cr uh, create the uh, finish that we want to achieve. And different sets of materials can give us different concrete finishes, depending not only on the material, but how the concrete is finished. A, a heavy sandblasted concrete is going to expose more of the rock, so the rock color is going to impact the uh, ultimate concrete finish more than the sand color will, for example, or the cement color. And with the different materials that are available, we have a wide variety of possibilities, not only just looking at the individual materials, but by looking at the different finishes. This is pretty hard to see, I know, but um, here in the uh, upper middle part of the uh, picture, we've got some heavy sandblasted aggregate uh, samples. Here we have some over here. And we could create an almost unlimited number of concrete finishes, concrete appearances, based on different materials and different mix designs and finishing techniques. So again, concrete gives us an almost limitless capability of designing the aesthetics that we're trying to achieve. But you have to understand not only the materials, but the characteristics of the materials, the color, the gratings. The grading will impact the characteristics of the concrete, the colors of the materials. This particular, well, I'm going to get into that in a few minutes, uh, but there's something, a, a secret about this one that I want to tell you about in a little bit. Uh, here's again one main place. And this is built with granite and white cement. And then here's a typical tilt-up uh, uh, strip mall, uh, a grocery store that has a seated aggregate and a tilt-up panel. So the materials are going to impact the finish that we're going to achieve. And we have to understand the materials that are available. If we have to truck a material in from 1,000 miles away, we are not talking about sustainable uh, concrete. We are talking about more expensive concrete and we're talking about something that's going to impact the environment even more. We want to understand the materials that are available. And then we combine those materials, we select the finish that we want to achieve, and that's going to be our ultimate concrete. But you have to be aware of contamination. All it takes is one little piece of an iron compound to create a rust streak a foot and a half or two feet long, and where that individual piece of aggregate would never be noticed, You've got a streak, a rust streak, running down the side of a building two feet long, and people can see it from a half mile away. So you've got to be knowledgeable about materials, what's available in the area, and the characteristics of those materials. Here's a project. This was a Home Depot floor, and we were in an area that had a lot of mica in the coarse aggregate, and so when they started polishing the floors and finishing them off and, and sealing them and so forth, all of a sudden all this mica started appearing, and it looked like we had glitter stuck in the concrete. And Home Depot's tearing their hair out, uh, saying, this is not what we expected to have. The contractor's saying, what do I do, what do I do? My comment was, tell Home Depot you're not going to charge them for the architectural concrete. But uh, I don't think Home Depot liked that one very much. Uh, we had to go through and chip out every last one of those pieces of mica and, and patch uh, the concrete, and, which is not something Home Depot likes to do in the first place. So anyway, you've got to understand the materials, not only the uh, characteristics that are readily apparent, but also you have to be aware of possible contamination from um, undesirable materials. The concrete mix, how all the concrete materials are brought together is important because different mixes, even with the same materials, will give us different uh, aesthetics. And again, we have limitless possibilities by combining the materials in different concrete mixes, by using different um, different finishing uh, techniques, we can get different appearances for concrete. The finish will impact the appearance. You can see here what we've got here in the middle, the circular part, we've got as cast white cement concrete that contains a, an inter, well, a white coarse aggregate 
with an intermediate aggregate that's a darker gray. And so as we, without any kind of finishing whatsoever, we see the cement. When we have a light sandblast, or in this case that was actually a moderate sandblast, we start to see more of the intermediate particle sizes, and so we start to bring out the gray. When we have a, um, the heaviest sandblast, we start to see the coarse aggregate. So all from one concrete mix with one set of materials, we can achieve three or four different appearances. And by changing the mix around, we can impact how that concrete is going to look. For example, this concrete mix is gap graded. We've got a lot of large coarse aggregate particles. And you can see right there is a coarse aggregate particle. These were actually green. And then we had a light gray matrix back here. But you see we have very few small coarse aggregate particles in here. And then we have no really small particle, coarse aggregate particles or large sand particles. So it's like mason sand, fine mason sand is supporting the coarse aggregate, which allows us to get more of the coarse aggregate on the surface, but at the same time, these gap graded concrete mixes, they can give us a very interesting architectural appearance, but they tend to segregate more. And if you have variations in um, the concrete mix and how it's batched and how it's mixed or how it's placed, you'll see that segregation. And the uh, more of the contrast is between your coarse aggregate and your mortar, the greater the visual impact of the segregation is going to be. In other words, if I have black rocks, and if I have white mortar, and I have segregation in the concrete mix, then that's going to be much more apparent than if I have a medium gray stone and a light gray uh, mortar, that, that uh, impact is going to be much less because I have lower contrast between those two elements. So you've got to understand the impact of the concrete mix and the materials that are being used in the concrete mix. A well-graded aggregate mix on the left is going to behave differently and look differently than a gap-graded concrete mix on the right. And you can see, as I said, the gap-graded concrete mixes are going to tend to segregate more, especially at higher slumps. Back when we were doing architectural concrete in the 1960s and 70s, typically there were limits of four-inch maximum slump, because if we had more than that, we would tend to get segregation in the concrete mixes unless we went with the mix on the right, which had such a high stone content that the concrete mix didn't want to move at all, and you had maximum coarse aggregate density. Now let's look at reinforcing steel. This is always the fun one. How are you going to get not only a one and a half inch vibrator, but even a half inch rock particle between those pieces of reinforcing steel when they're touching each other? And yet, especially when you get into seismic zones, you see conditions like this all the time, not just with reinforcing steel, but with um, post-tensioning strand and with blockouts. Now, this is one of the places where people say that BIM is going to help us, building information modeling, because we can do conflict avoidance using BIM techniques. But we have to make sure that our BIM models are going to accurately reflect what is going on in the structure, Otherwise, we wind up with something like this, where the concrete can't get between the reinforcing steel. And we wind up with these gaps that have to be patched or filled in. So we have to look at reinforcing steel congestion, how that's going to impact not only our ability to place our concrete mix, but our ability to consolidate the concrete mix. And BIM is not the entire answer. For example, we have tolerances on bending or our ability to bend reinforcing steel. The, um, tight, uh, the larger the reinforcing steel, the greater the radius is going to be for the bend. And then plus we also have the tolerance that we're allowed to vary the, uh, um, uh, the manufacture of the reinforcing steel. You can see here that we've got uh, these, these steel bars are all within tolerance for the particular application they were designed. And they're supposed to go into a one inch topping slab. It's not going to happen. We've got to have the right cover on the reinforcing steel. Otherwise, we have failures like this and like this. But at the same time, we need to make sure that the concrete is constructed properly. We don't improperly use a chair like this, which is going to wind up leaving uh, two long rust marks on the concrete as the, uh, the cover on the uh, 
thin film of concrete over that chair is eroded away and then the, the uh, chair starts to rust. So we have to understand what the objectives are, but we also have to understand how what we're doing in the field impacts the quality of the concrete. We don't want conditions like this. We need to look at the design details. The uh, reinforcing design on the left, when we're looking at the splice, has the constriction at the top, which is a more typical uh, constriction, but that inhibits our ability to place the concrete. If we open up the top and have the constriction at the bottom, it makes it a lot easier for us to place and consolidate that concrete. Here's a column. If we have the interior that's open, we can place the concrete and vibrate it very easily. If we have it divided in, uh, in this case, quadrants, it's very restricted and more difficult for us to place and consolidate the concrete. So we want to look at other techniques, such as down here, we've actually got uh, bundled bars, the one that's labeled adequate. I'm trying to get the mouse to come back up again. And because I have to use the mouse, otherwise the people on the webinar won't be able to see it. Here we've got a three bar bundle. We're allowed to have up to three bars in a bundle and not reduce the uh, cross-sectional area of the reinforcing steel, but that has to be designed by the detailer. So the detailer needs to design uh, um, reinforcing steel conditions that are going to be constructible. If he designs something like number B up there, we're going to have difficulty placing and consolidating the concrete. And here again is another example of bundling. We have the bars all spread out across the top. It's going to be very difficult to place and consolidate. When we start to bundle bars, we can open up spaces for the vibrators to go down and help us consolidate the concrete. And self-consolidating concrete would help in something like this, but it's not always available and it's not always the best answer. We also have to look at the details, especially when we were working in the days of pencil and paper, then it was very easy for an uh, architect or a detailer to detail something like this with a reinforcing steel. But when you look at the actual condition with the radius of the bend that we're able to get, you wind up with something that looks more like this, and there's no way to place the, uh, a vibrator down into that concrete. So if you have a BIM model that supports the uh, detail on the left, I mean, theoretically, that's what the BIM was told, but that's not what we have. The BIM model has to understand that this is what that particular model looks like because of the radius of bend that we've got. Also, the reinforcing steel directs the vibrator to a location. If we've got vertical bars right here in between the horizontal bars, which is something usually detailers don't like to do, they want to have the, the vertical bars on the outside. If the vertical bars are on the inside, then it makes it a lot easier for us to get the vibrator down between the vertical bars. We don't have the horizontal bars blocking us. And here's a single curtain of steel. We always want to have the vertical bar placed on the non-architectural side of the concrete because we want to place the vibrator here and not place the vibrator between the reinforcing steel and the exposed surface. Otherwise, we'll wind up with vibrator burns that look like this. So the reinforcing steel is going to direct where that vibrator is going to go. If the concrete has to be vibrated and the steel is blocking access to the interior of the concrete, the vibrator operator is going to stick his vibrator between the reinforcing steel and the formwork and give us a burn like this. The next thing we want to look at is formwork. Now a lot of people say that concrete is a modular material. Concrete is not a modular material. Concrete is a plastic material. It takes the shape and the appearance of whatever it's formed against. It's formwork that is a modular material and if we understand that then we can make use of that to develop less expensive buildings. If we have a building where we have a module that's repeated over and over again, we could have much less expensive concrete formwork, which means much less expensive concrete. But if we have a system that has a whole lot of curves, every face is different from every other face, that is not a modular system. It may be more aesthetically pleasing in some cases and worth money, but it's going to be a much more expensive option. And concrete will always mirror the formwork. If we have a patch in our formwork, if we have a form butt joint, then we will have concrete that looks like that patch or that form butt joint. 
So you've got to understand the material that you're forming against is going to be representative of what your actual appearance is going to be. You'd be amazed how many architectural concrete specifications I see that say BB form plywood or other approved material. BB form plywood is for structural concrete never intended for architectural concrete, but many times you'll still find it allowed in an architectural concrete project and you wind up with concrete that looks like it's been formed against BB form plywood. We have a lot of other materials we can use instead. We can use plastics, we can use elastomerics, we can use wood forms if they're good quality. We can use overlaid wood forms, high density or medium density. All of these different materials are going to give us different appearances on our concrete. A sealed wood form is going to have a different appearance than an unsealed wood form. Um, a, we've done cases where we've done very elaborate uh, formwork and then use boat builders to put fiberglass over the entire formwork so that we have a totally um, impervious concrete formwork, no butt joints to work with, to deal with, and so we wind up with very uniform concrete. There are lots of possibilities about formwork. Some of them are more uh, expensive than others. Some of them are going to be more reusable than others. For example, steel forms are very expensive initially, but if you've got a system that repeats uh, throughout a structure, you can use a steel form and become very cost effective on that project. For example, I believe one main place was built using steel forms. There's a project over in Fort Worth, the first United Tower. It's a 40-story office building that was built using steel forms. And because we were reusing those forms, it made the concrete formwork much less expensive. But if we have problems with form butt joints or with construction joints leaking, we'll wind up with something like this that has to be repaired. Or we'll wind up with boat patches. I was talking about BB ply form. And here's an example of a type of boat patch on BB ply form that we want to avoid. And so if you're just specifying exposed concrete against BB ply form, you may wind up with something like this. If you want something that's more uniform in appearance, you need to specify a forming material that's going to allow you to uh, uh, produce that more uniform appearance. And here, for example, you can see at the bottom of the building, we have darker concrete than we do on the next layer and on the next layer. This was all um, high-density overlaid plywood, but when the concrete was cast against it the first time, the high-density overlaid plywood absorbed some of the moisture and left us with darker concrete. The second time, it didn't absorb as much moisture. The third time, at the top, then it hardly absorbed any moisture at all. Now you can imagine what would have happened if at the very top we had a damaged panel and we replaced it with a brand new panel. We'd have a dark spot right up in the middle of that light concrete on the third layer. My dad always called this chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla. And it's uh, not as nice as Neapolitan ice cream. In fact, it can be downright frustrating when you're trying to get vanilla all the way up and down or chocolate all the way up and down. You have to understand what's going on with the formwork to make sure that it doesn't impact the appearance of what you're trying to achieve. Looking at release agents. A lot of people think that if a little bit of release agent's good, a lot of release agent's better. And that's not the case. Too much release agent will kill the surface of the concrete. And in this particular case, after they applied the release agent, they walked on these beam forms, and you can bet, well, I know for a fact that when they removed these beam forms and you looked up, you could see every one of those footprints on the beam, on the soffit of the beam. So you've got to understand the impact of the release agent. In this particular case, we had too much release agent, and you can see these dark splotches. What these dark splotches were um, is, there we are, the dark splotches are where we had too much release agent, which delayed the set of the concrete, and so when they stripped the forms, it actually pulled the skin of the concrete off. And so where the, we have white color or lighter colored concrete, the skin was left on. Where we had the blotches, that's where we had too much release agent, and the skin was pulled off. And here's another example of having too much release agent on the right versus adequate release agent on the left. So we need to work at sealing form joints, not only form butt joints where we put two plywood panels together, but uh, and we can do that either with foam tape or with, in this case, polyethylene tape or other techniques that you can use to try and uh, like caulk 
silicone caulk to minimize water penetration through those form joints. We can also look at construction joints. And you can see here that we've got concrete, old concrete that was cast. Now a lot of people like to put the rustication in the concrete at the bottom of a pore. We like to put it at the top of the pore because then when you reassemble the forms for the next lift, the rustication actually acts as a seal against the top of the preceding pore. And so if there is any leakage, it will occur behind the surface of the concrete. And here's a sample of that in real life. You can see the gasketing tape right there. And when we uh, pull these forms in tight, that gasketing tape will seal off against the previous concrete. And so we can minimize the amount of uh, leakage that we get. But that means we need to have this rustication. Sometimes when footings are cast, we have nice smooth top surfaces, and then we cast a wall on top, we get leakage at the bottom of the wall. Well, the problem is that we've got a formwork coming down on top of this nice smooth surface. It would be a lot better if we could raise up the footing a little bit, cast a rustication there at the top of the footing, and then have something to suck in against when we're assembling the, uh, the subsequent forms. So you need to understand the impact of formwork of construction joints. If the architect designs his pore line so that it's at the bottom of this construction joint, then we don't have the ability to use this detail to minimize our, um, to minimize our leakage. If the pore line is, is scheduled for there, we don't have the ability to create this extra little uh, three quarters of an inch that's going to help seal off the form. Form butt joint locations. Form butt joints will leak. And if we've got BB ply form or if we've got HDO ply form, if the form butt joints are not well put together, we're going to have leakage. And then we're going to wind up with something like this. So form butt joint leakage is one of the factors that I think architects tend to complain most about. In some cases, a little bit's actually acceptable. If you go over to the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, which is recognized as one of the leading architectural uh, concrete projects in the country, you will see form butt joints. If you look at the Pulitzer Museum, you will see form butt joints. It's just when we have really bad ones with really bad leakage and bad honeycomb, that's when people start to object. We need to look at our forms to make sure they're designed properly for stripping. We don't want to have uh, negative re-entrant corners that we cannot pull the forms out from. We need to have chamfers, and we don't want to have square corners either. You can see that each one of these uh, wooden forms actually has a little bit of a chamfer, so we should have been able to strip the formwork without the damage, but they forgot to put a wood sealer on this. So the form absorbed the water from the concrete, the wood swelled, when it was time to remove the form, the forms fell, fell apart. We have different ties that are designed to prevent leakage. A tie like this is not designed to prevent leakage. Cone ties are not really designed to prevent leakage, but key bolts, she bolts, other form techniques we can use that can greatly minimize the leakage from the form ties. And if we do have leakage, we wind up with something like this, which is impossible to get rid of by sandblasting. That just will accentuate the problem. Then we've got placement techniques. We want to be able to place the, prop, the concrete by different methods, whether it be by bucket, by pump, by conveyor belt. And we need to make sure that we don't have segregation. This is from uh, an ACI document on avoiding segregation. We don't want the concrete bouncing off the reinforcing steel, causing rock pockets or sand pockets. We can use special techniques to avoid situations like this. This was caused by a window blockout where the contractor placed the concrete on this side first and the, this side and thought he was going to vibrate the concrete to meet in the middle. You almost always get something like this. The better technique is to place the concrete all on one side. And in this particular case, we had some uh, tubing that went through the uh, block out that allowed us to insert our vibrator. So we placed our concrete over here, made it cut, run down through here, then vibrated the concrete so it continued to run down. We never placed any concrete over here until the concrete became visible, uh, came up to the bottom of the block out. And we just kept feeding more and more concrete. We did have to make the concrete run this distance, but by using these tubes, we were able to get the vibrators down to make the concrete run properly. I've done blockouts as long as 12 feet using this technique without any honeycomb underneath the blockout. But we need to make sure that we don't do things that are going to result in um, uh, uh, 
lift lines that are going to be apparent. We need to make sure that we knit the layers of the concrete together, that we don't have uh, segregation or bleeding that are going to result in situations like this. Consolidation. We have different types of consolidation uh, equipment that's going to give us different impacts, different types of motors that are going to give us uh, different effects. For example, these backpack motors that some people will have for portable vibrators, those are usually direct drive vibrators. They operate at a very low frequency. Those typically will result in segregation. We want high frequency vibrators that are going to have what's called a radius of influence. This is actually sort of hard to see, but when you place the vibrator, by the way, this vibrator is placed improperly. It should be placed vertically. This has been placed at an angle, but you might be able to see that around through here, you can see the concrete on the surface is nice and smooth, and that's be, uh, indicating the uh, area of influence of this vibrator. If we insert this vibrator at a distance of three feet, then that means the concrete in the center foot is not going to get vibrated. We need to make sure we have appropriate overlap between the vibrator insertions, and usually concrete is extremely under-vibrated, not over-vibrated like a lot of people were, are concerned about, unless you're talking about higher uh, uh, improperly designed mixes that are at a higher slump, it's very easy to over-vibrate those. But the problem is with the mix design, not with the vibration technique. We need to have clear space to put the vibrators. You see here, we've got a window open right here, we've got a window open right here. If this was uniform across the top, we would not be able to place a vibrator. But by maintaining windows for us to place a vibrator, we can place the concrete and minimize any honeycomb. And if we do have too much uh, steel congestion, we get something like this. And again, talking about bundling bars to allow us to place the, uh, the vibrator. Now, one of the things that we did as part of our study on architectural concrete is we cast uh, we cast uh, some uh, columns of concrete that had one form face was plexiglass. And then we put white cement concrete into it. Gray cement's too dark, it won't work. You put white cement concrete in and you vibrate the concrete and you watch these bubbles come up. And you can see right here, um, I've got a very large bubble. And these bubbles we find rise at the rate of about one to two inches a second. So if you've got a three foot lift, then you need to vibrate that lift of concrete between 18 and 36 seconds. Normally, uh, uh, those of you that have watched vibration operations, the vibrator operator throws this vibrator down and then brings it back up, and that's all it gets. So it gets about maybe a quarter of the vibration it actually needs. When the vibrator tip gets above the air bubbles, the air bubbles stop moving. So the vibrator tip needs to go all the way down to the bottom and come up to the top. And like I said before, we want to insert the vibrator vertically so we don't get segregation. And you can see here a proper vibration train. We place the concrete. We have one vibrator operator that's leveling out the concrete. We have an inspector behind him. And then a second vibrator operator that comes along and vibrates the concrete until all the air bubbles have left. Now I want to show you this. This is a little video that I did. Let's see if it comes across. Those of you that are um, uh, watching via webinar, you may not whoops, you may not see this come across. There we go. Um, this is a little video on how to vibrate architectural concrete. I did this about five years ago because I was tired of trying to describe very poorly how to vibrate architectural concrete. You take the vibrator, take it all the way down to the bottom of the concrete, and then you start to pull it out with a churning motion. And you want to uh, raise the tip of the vibrator uh, about one to two inches a second. You can see how slowly I'm coming out of the concrete at this point, and it's coming up the rate of about one to two inches a second. And the churning motion, when you push down, it actually pushes the air bubbles up. And so that, there's another mechanical motion there that helps remove those air bubbles from the concrete. And so we keep coming up at the rate of about one to two inches a second. I'm actually going a bit faster here uh, for the purposes of the video. And then when you get to the top of the lift, you actually want to take the vibrator out rapidly, otherwise the vibrator will go, will start to churn air back into the concrete. Then when you come in for the second lift, you want to go all the way down into the previous lift of concrete, and then start doing your churning motion. Make sure that you do a lot of churning there at the line between the first lift and the second lift, and uh, so that you knit those two layers together, and you avoid a lift line later on. 
So I'm going to go ahead and skip past the rest of that. Uh, but if we don't consolidate concrete properly, we have problems. Yes, sir, you had a question? Okay. The question is, how far would you insert the vibrators? A vibrator is rated for a radius of influence, and so if a vibrator has a radius of influence of 18 inches, you want to do your insertions at about 80% of the diameter of influence. So say the radius of influence was 15 inches. That makes the diameter 30 inches. 80% of 30 is 24 inches, so you want to insert at 24 inch centers. So if we don't do it properly, we wind up with problems, lift lines, honeycomb, and leakage, and air bubbles. I've got to finish up very rapidly here. We've got to have the right kind of equipment, uh, not only for placing, but also for finishing. A Venturi nozzle, for example, on sandblast to help uh, get a more uniform finish instead of a straight bore nozzle. Proper safety equipment for the uh, sandblast operator. We can use needle scalers. We can use chipping hammers a variety of different tools to finish the concrete because each of these tools is going to give us a different appearance. So you need to understand the impact of those tools. Here is 50, uh, this is uh, Southern Bell headquarters in uh, Atlanta where we actually had a bush hammered finish. You may notice that the concrete at the rustications is a little bit lighter. That's because we couldn't bush hammer the edges without destroying them. And we have different types of finishes that we can get from different types of impact hammers or needle scalers or what have you. You can patch concrete so that it's, um, the patches are invisible. Uh, on the left, you see a, a, a precast job where we had different quality of patch finish as so we have light and dark sections. Here you can see where somebody hand seeded the aggregate for an exposed aggregate finish. But down here at the bottom, this is a, um, a patch, well this is where we cut out some sections of a sample of sandblasted concrete. This is after the concrete's been finished, uh, has been patched, and you cannot see the patches that are in the architectural concrete. Patching architectural concrete is an art form, and you need to hire artists to do that kind of work. And then finally, we have the management, the testing. Make sure the testing lab provides the test results to the concrete producer. It's now part of ASTM C94. And 318, the concrete producer is required to receive the test results for his concrete. So that's a very important thing that needs to be considered. But I know many a concrete producer who's had to pull out good concrete because of bad testing. This is not a good concrete test cylinder. You can see we have the vertical fracture instead of the, the nice double cones or uh, today using uh, neoprene caps, uh, the shear cones and so forth. So it all goes back to the process, making sure all the parts fit, understanding the process. If you change the shape of one part, you have to change the shape of another part to make sure the, uh, the process fits. And Murphy's Law, nothing's as easy as it looks. Everything takes longer than you expect. If anything can go wrong, it will, and at the worst possible moment. I know of perfect concrete, architectural concrete projects where the only blemish on the concrete surface is right in front of the president's parking spot. And that's where it's almost always going to happen. Uh, we have some case histories. I'll put this online. Southern Bell Building, white, uh, white cement, uh, granite, gave us nice form uh, finishes. 1515 Poitras in New Orleans, we did the same thing. The Kennedy Memorial, which is a block and a half away from here. Uh, Philip Johnson's design using uh, pre-cast post-tension concrete. Park West, the spandrel covers here are precast, the columns are cast in place. Two different cements, one's type three, one's type one, but by you going to different manufacturers, we were actually able to match the color. One main place, use the method for using a pre-placed aggregate and an overgrouted mortar that went into the middle. And the summer palace for the Shah of Iran, where you had a geodesic dome with structures, uh, with the supports that came together, where you had like six or eight different supports and the steel connections, again, that was a pre-placed aggregate job. My father figured out how to do that. Mississippi Power and Light, it survived two Category 5 hurricanes with almost no damage. That shows you the strength of concrete. Fort Worth Water Gardens, Park Central, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, sorry for the problems that we had, and if anybody has any questions, I actually have to run chair a meeting right now. I'm late for it but I'll be available at the concrete mixer at the chapter hospitality desk 
Uh, just look for me in my uh, leather vest as part of the host chapter. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending.